You're listening to Florida Matters, I'm Matthew Petty. If you're a foodie, you're probably already streaming the new season of The Zest, WSF's podcast celebrating the intersection of food and Florida. Coming up, you'll get a taste of what's on offer from host Delia Colon. Season 10 of The Zest includes vegan fare for theme park buffs, what basketball pros eat when they're on the road, kitchen hacks, and more. And Delia sits down with author and restaurant owner Randy Wayne White. Here's White explaining how he started a line of hot sauce. So, invested $5,000 when I had maybe $7,000. And then probably two months later, a big semi-truck pulls up in front of my little house on Pine Island, on a semi-truck, on a very narrow one-way lane road. I thought, what in the heck? It was the hot sauce. Boxes and boxes, crates and crates of this hot sauce. I had to enlist two or three friends to help me get it into the house. The house was packed with the stuff. And that lovely floral aroma, you'll smell this, it's incredible. And, and I, I realized I had nowhere to sell it. I say I'm a business whiz. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm thinking I'd be like sneezing and my eyes would be watering if my house was full of hot sauce. Okay, you're opening it up. Oh, we're we about to do a taste test. Let me smell. Okay. Oh, it's nice. Okay, here, Alex, you smell. All right, so Delia, this is you talking with White at one of his restaurants, Doc Ford's Rum Bar and Grill in St. Petersburg. How did he go from hot sauce to starting the restaurant franchise? I know, right? So he is the author of this series of novels. The main character is Marion Doc Ford, who's a marine biologist. And before that, Randy was a journalist. So he would travel around, and that's how he got into um, peppers in South America and Central America. Mm -hmm. He needed a place to sell the hot sauce. He realized, I'm never going to make money on this. Maybe I can partner with a restaurant, an existing restaurant, to have a place to sell the hot sauce. And then one thing led to another. And he now has, I believe, four restaurants on Florida's Gulf Coast, Doc Ford's Rum Bar and Grill, because he also has a passion for rum and the history of rum. So he's really not involved in the day-to-day operation of the restaurants, but he's lending his character's name. He designed the bottle. Mm -hmm. His signature is on the bottle, and he says it's the best hot sauce he's ever had. Now, he's a best-selling author, as you point out. He was on a book tour when you spoke to him. What might people not realize about White the foodie, even if they know White the author? So before he was an author and a journalist, he was a fishing guide. Mm -hmm. So he can tell you how to catch the fish, how to be safe in the boat, how to cook the fish. And he's from my home state of Ohio. So he also has that Midwestern side with like the casseroles and things like that. So um, he will admit he is not the chef. He stays out of the day-to-day operation, but he's really into that. And he's a huge risk taker. I mean, you heard him say he had $7,000 in his bank account and he spent 5000 on producing this hot sauce. So he just mm-hmm. has a million stories like that. Yeah, and then seemed a little surprised when the truck pulled up to his house with the, the hot sauce. And I just, so. My nose is burning, even just like hearing about it. Can you imagine a house full of hot sauce? <laughs> yeah. What surprised you about that conversation, though? Like what kind of hidden gems came up? Okay, well, one of my favorite moments from the conversation was not even with him. It was when I walked in because he's got these four restaurants. He lives, I believe, now in Teresia, so in our mm-hmm. area. But he's not in these restaurants every day. So it's a big deal. He was there to promote his new book, One Deadly Eye, which is about the aftermath of a hurricane. And I overheard one of the bartenders say, oh, my gosh, I feel like Buddy the Elf when Santa is coming. You know what I mean? (laughs) Like that Will Ferrell movie Elf. And Santa is their, you know, Beyonce, their Taylor Swift, their Mick Jagger. And now they're finally getting to meet him in person. Mm -hmm. And so you know how you can tell a lot about someone by what other people say about them when they're not around? So just hearing the excitement of this bartender made me realize, like, I knew he was a big deal. I haven't personally read any of his novels, but I, of course, was familiar with his name. And just hearing how excited people were and how full the restaurant got. I mean, during the course of our conversation, you could hear how loud it was getting. Mm-hmm. Um, just made me realize what a treat it was and how special it was that he took the time to sit in a booth with us and just talk about those early days of starting the restaurant. So he's got star power, but he obviously comes across as pretty down to earth, right, in that conversation? 100%. Yeah. So you turn to your colleagues on the Zest for some kitchen hacks, including gadgets they love. Here's producer Andrew Lucas talking about his air fryer. 
I'll do like sesame tofu in there. Sometimes if I want to just like quickly brown or crisp up some vegetables or something like that, I'll put them in there. We've done grilled cheese sandwiches in there. I've found that I get really nice crispy things, very low oil and fat. So it's a sort of a, I wouldn't call it healthy, but it's healthier certainly than like deep frying or pan frying. And I will say this as we are a Florida podcast, it sure beats having to crank your oven up to 450 on a hot summer day. Delia, what are some of your favorite kitchen hacks? Oh, man. It's hard to think of them because they're just things I do naturally. You probably have some, too. And I want to find out what yours are, by the way. Mm -hmm. Um, One of mine is to sprinkle fresh herbs and a sprinkle of fresh citrus. We've talked to so many chefs on this podcast, and they all talk about just adding that element to make it um, a little more home cooked, you Mm -hmm. know. It's a spectrum. It doesn't have to be completely from scratch or you're getting DoorDash. There's a spectrum in there. So, like, after this, I'm going to go home, and for lunch, I'm probably going to have these frozen samosas that I got from Aldi. But I have fresh cilantro growing in my yard, and I have some limes on my counter. So I'm going to sprinkle some of those. I would say, especially for people who don't love to cook yet, just get a good knife. Forget all those other fancy gadgets. Just get yourself a good knife. We had on a few seasons ago Bridget and Julia from America's Test Kitchen, the PBS cooking show, and they say you don't need the knife, you know, the the 15 different knives. You just need, like, a big knife and a little knife. And so getting a good knife makes cutting things so much easier. You're less likely to hurt yourself, and it just makes it a joy. Yeah. Got to keep it sharp too, right? Oh, yeah. I I need to work on that. (laughs) (laughs) So... Um, speaking of testing and getting acquainted with things in the kitchen, last time we talked to you, you were explaining the process of writing your cookbook, the Florida Vegetarian Cookbook, and a lot of testing went into that. I'm wondering, did that experience change the way you use your kitchen or kind of add some hacks to your repertoire? It did. I think it helped me get back to basics. I mean, this season we interview Giuliano Hassan, who's the only child of the famed uh, Italian cooking teacher, Marcella Hassan. And she's famous for her like four ingredient um, marinara sauce. Mm-hmm. And so when you talk to these people, they talk about using good ingredients. You're like, what is a good olive oil? What's a good salt? But writing this cookbook, okay. I'm a mom. It was during COVID that I was writing this. And so I was very busy and having to even write down one more ingredient or one more step, I just didn't have the bandwidth to do that. So I tried to strip down everything to as few ingredients as possible. Um, But that's what we should all be doing anyway, I realized. Mm -hmm. Instead of 10 ingredients, use five really good ones. Like splurge a little bit on the better quality olive oil that's like from a single country and maybe get a couple of different salts so you can decide which one you want to use when. And the book Salt, Fat, Acid, Heat is great for, you know, learning the ins and outs of that. Thank you to Andrew for actually um, introducing that book to me. But I have found that less really is more. Um, Something else I found after the writing process, but during the photography process, I worked with Chip Wiener, who's a a food photographer in South Tampa, and he taught me about the color wheel. Do you remember the color wheel from art class? Oh, sure, yeah. The different colors are across from each other. So I think like purple's across from yellow and red's across from green. But every chef has told me we eat with our eyes first Mm -hmm. and a quick way to make a meal more attractive, in addition to sprinkling the fresh herbs, because everything just looks more fancy with fresh herbs. But another way to achieve that uh, visual appeal is to add a contrasting color. So if you have um, spaghetti with red marinara sauce, you just add a sprinkle of basil on top. So now you have the red with the green Mm -hmm. and your eyes will just like be having a party. You know what I mean? Your eyes will want to eat that. If you have something yellow, if you have corn, okay, maybe you don't have something purple to put with it. But how about like a purple napkin? that you got at the thrift store, a cloth napkin. It could even Mm -hmm. be something like that. So it has taught me so much about the visual aspect of food. You know how like with with oral communication, people just think only the words I say matter, but Mm -hmm. we know that it's your tone and it's your body language. It's almost like the visuals are the tone and the body language of the food. Mm -hmm. You also got some tips during this season from a basketballer who plays in Puerto Rico and Portugal and who happens to be your stepdaughter. What did you learn from Ariel Colon about eating like an athlete? Wow, this was so funny. She was in the kitchen um, joking. Oh, I should be on your podcast. And I was like, actually, that's brilliant. And she was getting ready to go to Puerto Rico in like two days. So I was like, listen, tomorrow, 
be there. <laughs> yeah, those, those dangerous words to say to a podcast uh, host, they really right? Are. They really are. But like the light bulb went off. So, yes, she plays professional basketball for a team called Patriotas de Lares. They're currently in their season. And then in the winter, she's in Portugal for a team called uh, Los Galitos, the Roosters. Mm-hmm. And I've watched her grow up since she was seven and now she's 25. Um one thing she taught me, I love I love a discount. I'm wearing um, clothes from the consignment shop right now. But if it's free, it's not always necessarily for me, especially when it comes to food. I learned that a lot of these overseas teams especially, they, they pay their players partially in like food vouchers for restaurants and things like that that are sponsors for the team. Mm-hmm. So they're paid partially in free food. Not always the food you want to be using to fuel your body. Hmm. So Ariel has at times um, declined the free food and then spent her own money to buy groceries and cook food at the house in Puerto Rico. And I think that's a good lesson for all of us because she paid attention to how she's feeling in practice, how she's feeling on the court. Does she feel heavy? Does she feel quick? And I'm not a professional basketball player. I know it's shocking. But we all have our own sort of game plan when we Mm -hmm. wake up in the morning. I could have eaten lunch at like 11 o'clock before I came to sit down with you, but I knew I wasn't going to feel my best if I did that. So I decided to wait and just have an apple instead. Um, So just thinking through what you want to achieve and how you want to feel at different stages of your day, I think is good. They also have snacks everywhere, (laughs) on the bus, in the locker room, at home. And that's a good lesson. I mean, I'm I'm the snack queen. I I never Mm -hmm. leave home without a snack. But um, if you find yourself getting too hungry, um, just keep some snacks in your car. It could be dried mango. It could be almonds or in your desk, something like that. So planning is key. Yes. Now, oftentimes on the Zest, you're exploring the impact of food businesses on the communities they serve. And you met up with Chef Marcus Clark of St. Petersburg and talked about his project, Yes Chef Village, which offers community dinners for families in food deserts. Here's Chef Marcus Clark. We conduct our suppers in a forest. Uh, a food forest that is, um, I'm partner with um, Kriya Serene Egren, and she has um, founded the Gulfport Food Forest, and I partner with her so that we can host our suppers in the forest so that not only do they get a good meal, but they also get to learn about where the food came from because most of our food is sourced from the local farms, sourced from local gardens. All right, so a couple of terms there. I wonder if you could explain what's a food desert and what's a food forest. Okay, in a nutshell, a food desert is a place where healthy food cannot be easily accessed, where the only banana you might find is at the gas station and it's turning brown Mm -hmm. sitting on the counter. No grocery store or no easy way to get to the grocery store. And those tend to be your low-income black and brown areas. And then a food forest is the opposite. It's just what it sounds like. It's like a magical land full of, you know, mango trees and papayas. And there are actually seven levels, I think, to be considered a food forest. But when you look up, when you look at eye level, and when you look down, there's just edible goodness all around. Oh, wow. Okay. So um, what motivated Chef Marcus Clark to do what he's doing now? He has such an incredible story. I'm, I'm like his number one fan now. So he was raised in St. Pete with seven brothers and sisters. Dad worked. Mom was a stay-at-home mom, but dad now supporting a family of 10 on one income, like that's just not going to go very far. So they were on food stamps. And then at school, he got the free and reduced lunch. Um, Not very high quality food. And he told me he recently went to visit his seven-year-old son in the school cafeteria for lunch. Same exact food. (laughs) <laughs> I know you have kids. I have kids. It's those same chicken patties mm-hmm. and the same, you know, square pizza from when we were little. Yeah. Which Ketchup is... counts as a vegetable. Right. What a shame. They're still pushing milk. Like, mm-hmm. what are we doing? <laughs> no, no shade against milk. But like, you know, there's a lot more you could be doing. And so he was just so disappointed that like nothing has changed. He actually um, was telling me that for a while he was uh, incarcerated for selling drugs and he just didn't have... Any options, like a place where you don't have access to uh, healthy food, you probably don't have access to a lot of other opportunities as well. Mm -hmm. And so he ended up becoming a chef, and he just wants a better future for his kids and all the kids in the neighborhood. Yeah, I mean, just this idea of having a a supper for the community in a food forest, I mean, it sounds magical, right? It does. It sounds like a storybook. You're listening to Florida Matters and Dalia Cologne, host of The Zest, WUSF's podcast that celebrates the intersection of food and Florida. 
Coming up, more highlights from season 10 of The Zest, which is streaming now. You'll hear how a cup of joe can bring communities together, and the owners of a St. Petersburg company share secrets of success in the competitive daily grind of the coffee business. You're listening to Florida Matters, broadcasting from the doctors Lorraine Rubis and Neil Frankel studio at WUSF in Tampa. I'm Matthew Petty. When it comes to getting your daily coffee fix, there's a lot of competition, so presentation is key for any company that wants to stand out. On the new season of WUSF's The Zest podcast, host Delia Cologne meets with the owners of two Tampa Bay area coffee companies. She discovers the deep connections each one has with their communities. Also, coming up in about 10 minutes, you'll hear how bloggers are helping guide theme park goers to some of the tastiest vegan fare around. And Dalia gets a hands-on lesson in cheesemaking. Now, you also visited Coffee Uniting People, or CUP. It's a non-profit Tampa coffee shop that specializes in employing people with disabilities. And that show will drop a little bit later in the season. But you talked with Laura Jones and Greg Jones. They launched the coffee shop in 2021 and barista Katie Hustle. Let's take a listen. I mean, I'm open about sharing this. I have like moderate to severe ADHD and like Tourette syndrome. So it's like disabilities that aren't always like seen physically. But the nice thing about CUP is I'll I'll work there. I'll have a little trouble maybe organizing lots of orders that are coming in. And then somebody and I'll be like, uh oh, I, you know, I don't know what I'm doing. I, you know, I'll kind of freeze up a little bit. And then like whoever is um is the shift lead that day will be like, okay, well, let's take it one step at a time. And then like I'll be walked through it instead of being expected to just know it. All right, so what made Laura and Greg want to launch this coffee shop? Oh, first of all, I just love Katie Huddle. I saw her in a play recently. She's so talented. So shout out to Katie. Laura and Greg, he's an attorney, and he got his uh, master's degree in nonprofit organization or something like that, and they Mm -hmm. had previously been involved with a baseball team uh, with little, kids. little league, right? Yeah, with yeah. kids that had disabilities. And so that always, you know, had a place in his heart. And he wanted to start a nonprofit. This is a nonprofit coffee shop. So I don't believe they have their own child with special needs. But I mean, once you set foot in this community, you just want to be involved because you see how amazing these people are. They and obviously we're talking about a range of disabilities and ages. And so it's not a one size fits all. But they are, many of them are unemployed, but not unemployable, mm-hmm. I think is how Greg put it. And Katie, I mean, you just hear the, the sparkle in her voice. She actually um, does uh, voice acting for podcasts and she does theater here in Tampa Bay. She's just incredible. She's in her 20s. A lot of these people are in their 20s and they're learning transferable skills. Mm-hmm. I mean, show me a job where you don't need to interact with people, be organized, right? Have good time management skills. And so these are skills that they can use in the community. And many of these people are just absolutely a joy to be around. Like imagine starting your day with a cup of coffee from someone like Katie. It's just, it would change your whole day. And they've got two shops. And I think when you spoke to them, they had another on the way. So they must be doing something right. And I'm just wondering, what does that tell you about the need for this kind of business or this kind of nonprofit? I'm so happy to see that these types of businesses are um, getting the spotlight they deserve because people with different abilities have always been around throughout all of time and all over the world, and they're not going away. And there are a lot of skills they have that we can all benefit from. And so, of course, you can't have a coffee uniting people on every corner, but Greg and Laura are really on a mission to encourage all employers to consider hiring someone with disabilities. Mm -hmm. And speaking of coffee, you also met the owners of Kawa Coffee, which is based in St. Petersburg. There's a lot of competition in the coffee business, but it wasn't like that when Rafael and Sarah Perrier started Kawa 18 years ago. We we met in Philadelphia. We did the coffee thing, which was fun. I was working for a company called La Colombe at the time, which is not a pretty big company uh, in the U.S., and uh, kind of learned the business up there and then we did something else in between which is a bar nightclub for five years uh, together and then sold everything moved down here and uh, looked around there was no coffee company at the time really around except a couple uh, weird things and uh, we just decided to create Kawa and uh, you know I asked Sarah to come in you know she was a dancer but she also ran the, the dance company which was a non-profit and uh, the idea was, you know, if you run, if you were able to run a non-profit, you should be able to run a profit company. So that was when we started Kawa. And we did uh, Kawa 
only wholesale at first, the first couple of years, and then after that, I started retail. And you said at the time there weren't that many coffee companies. That's mm-hmm. it. Just seems hard to believe. I mean, at the time, yeah, there was the Globe Coffee Shop, which was more of like a open mic yeah. nighttime coffee shop, which was a cool place to go. Then there was Starbucks. Um, in Tampa, there was some Joffrey's Coffee. So what did Rafael and Sarah Perrier tell you about how they've managed to grow Kawa Coffee in the last 18 years? Mm. Yeah, you can't have a coffee shop on every business, but Kawa's coming pretty close. <laughs> yeah, right. Yeah, so they actually met in Philadelphia at a coffee shop. She was not a coffee drinker, and he was working there. Mm-hmm. And he's got that charming French accent, and so next thing you know, he's got her drinking coffee, and then they started this business here in Tampa Bay. Um, they now even have locations in Texas. I mean, they're just killing it. Mm-hmm. And, of course, you need a good product, and you need um, a good team because you can't be everywhere. But beyond that, their marketing game is unmatched. Mm -hmm. Um, They don't necessarily drink Starbucks, but they appreciate Starbucks marketing tactics. If you think about how cheap it is to actually produce a cup of coffee and then what some of these bigger chains are charging, they're doing something right. They're making it Instagrammable, so it's got to be pretty. Mm -hmm. You want the coffee to taste the same every day, pretty much, if you're going there every day for your morning coffee. But you want to have a little bit of a different experience, some novelty to keep you coming back. So they do things like changing the bag. They've collaborated with the Tampa Bay Rays baseball team. They've collaborated with local artists like the abstract artist Yala Ford to give people a reason to keep coming in and getting these um, like limited edition bags with beautiful artwork on it. And of course, their social media, I mean, they're crushing it. It was interesting, though, listening to that conversation and hearing them talk about what the scene was like 18 years ago, right? They're they're, they're like, there is really nothing around. Yeah, I can't imagine. And they have an 18-year-old daughter. Mm -hmm. So the coffee shop has grown up with their daughter. And speaking of kids, something else they've learned is you have to offer alternatives for the non-caffeinated crowd, you know? My birthday was a couple weeks ago, and it was my daughter who said, hey, we got to go to Starbucks and get Mm -hmm. your free drink because she wanted something. Um, And she got this fancy lemonade. And so they've started offering lemonades because these kids, I mean, they have money to spend. When she empties the dishwasher, that's just pure, (laughs) that's just (laughs) pure, like, fun money to spend. And so giving everybody a reason to come in, the coffee drinkers, the tea drinkers, the kids. Mm -hmm. Now, Halloween Horror Nights is in full swing at Universal, and you caught up with Shelby Price of Universal Orlando Vegans. Uh, Here's Shelby. Just trying to get the word out. You know, I I feel bad when people, I see people comment in groups and they'll be like, oh, I'm vegan. I didn't find anything to eat at Universal. And I was like, you can't see, I mean, no one can see my face on the podcast, but I'm frowning because like, it makes me sad. There's almost every single restaurant has something to eat now. It may not be the greatest thing at all of them, but they almost all have a vegan option. Now, Delia, you know how challenging it can be sometimes trying to find vegan or even vegetarian dining options as a tourist, even a local. So how helpful are sites like Shelby's? Very helpful, especially to have a guide who's almost like become a friend. You know, if you follow some of these people on social media, like Matt, if you told me about a great restaurant I would love, I would be happy to go there more than just if I read it on some, you know, long dining guide. Mm -hmm. And so someone like Shelby, she lives in Orlando. She goes to the parks all the time. And, um, of course, you can bring your own food into the parks. A lot of people don't know that. Um, But I think it's tremendously helpful. Are there some more options out there now for restaurants at restaurants for vegans than there were, were, say, you know, 10 years ago? 100 percent. So. Just speaking specifically about the theme parks, a few years ago we had on Sharon Kennedy Wynn from the Tampa Bay Times, and she um, did some reporting around uh, the prevalence of plant-based options at Florida's theme parks and even like cruises and things like that. And a lot of these are aimed at the meat eaters because even those who aren't fully vegan or vegetarian are probably leaning into more of a plant-based diet, even if it's just like a meatless Monday. Mm -hmm. So yes, we have a lot of vegan and vegetarian restaurants. We have more restaurants offering those menu options because, okay, my husband eats meat and I don't. And so if he wants to go out to a steakhouse, there needs to be something for me besides a baked potato. Right. And they know that. (laughs) I love baked potatoes. But they know that. And so they're really catering to everyone. And, you know, plant-based or uh, gluten-free, low-carb, anything like that. And then within the theme parks, I mean, Shelby had my mouth watering talking about things like mofongo bites and um, crepes, like a cookie butter crepe. Doesn't Mm -hmm. that just sound incredible? There was a time when you'd go and if they had an option, it was probably just a veggie burger. And now they're getting so creative. Now, you've got a whole series planned for Italian American Heritage Month, which is in October. Cheeseology co-owner 
Kelly Hayes in Ybor City talks about how you can learn to make cheese. We do a creme de ricotta class. That is a really fun class. You come up with a, a cheese that's kind of in between a cream cheese and a ricotta in this recipe. We do a cannoli class where you make the filling. We do a charcuterie board class because everybody loves charcuterie boards. It's the Lunchables from the 90s. Oh, it's totally, nice. totally. We grew up <laughs> on Lunchables right. and now we're making Lunch charcuterie. Yes. All right. I love, I love that analogy, by the way. <laughs> it kind of really <laughs> brings it down to the, the um, common level, right? So what did you learn in your class? And what's the takeaway for people who can't eat dairy or maybe are trying to cut down? Oh, man, you're making me really hungry. <laughs> we need to have snacks at the next recording. So uh, my coworker, Alex Ebron, and I attended a um, cheese making class. They have all different options. We did the pizza class. So we made our own mozzarella. You know, you've seen people maybe at a, like a specialty grocery store, like stretching the mozzarella really long between their fingers. We actually got to do that. It was so much fun. Mm -hmm. Any type of class, I think, is it just like brings us back to our, our most basic state. It's fun to do stuff with your hands. I spend all day on a computer and just to be able to go in and like manipulate this like gooey, warm mozzarella was just so much fun. And then we used that to make pizza from scratch. And then they have a dining area in Cheezology where you can actually eat the pizza, have some wine. It was absolutely incredible. But beyond that, what I learned was there are different levels of lactose in cheese and some people probably already knew this but mm -hmm. i'm trying to eat less dairy because i just feel better when i do and kelly explained that if you get the aged cheeses like the cheddars and the parmesans the older it is the less lactose it contains just like the older we are you know our skin changes and mm -hmm. you know some of the elasticity goes away for cheese some of the lactose goes away and then you can even find lactose free cheese mm -hmm. the real cheese but it's so aged that it no longer contains the lactose oh wow okay now are you already plotting out the next season of the zest Oh, always. We worked a little differently this time. So this season is completely pretty much wrapped up in terms of production. And then we'll be starting the, I guess, season 11, which is wild to think about, in early 2025. Um, so we're always looking for new and interesting people to talk to. And it just never gets old. You know, everybody eats. And so everybody has a story to tell. Well, Delia Cologne, host and executive producer of The Zest. Season 10 is streaming now. And Delia is also the author of the Florida Vegetarian Cookbook. Delia, thanks so much for stopping by. Always a pleasure. Subscribe to Florida Matters wherever you get your podcasts. And you can watch on YouTube. Florida Matters executive producer is Grayson Doctor. Engineering support from Jackson Harp. I'm Matthew Petty. Thank you for listening.